Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us on this panel discussion on data management, flow, and pipelines. Uh, we have very different uh, diverse background people coming here. So we'll start with the introductions. So I'll go first. My name is Prakhar Bajpayee, and I am a senior data scientist at City of Austin. Uh, I, am, I have approximately six years of work experience in this field. So I maintain City of Austin's center of excellence where we do a lot of advanced analytics and artificial intelligence based products. And nice to see you all and I'm uh, happy to uh, talk with other uh, panelists on this member. Razi, do you wanna go next? Absolutely. Hi, I'm uh, Razi Razirin. I'm a uh, co-founder and, and CEO of uh, a startup called Feature Byte, uh, based in Boston and uh, spent the last 20 years with uh, data and analytics startups. I was with a company called Natiza, uh, which was in the data warehousing space. Uh, and more recently, I was with a company called uh, Data Robot, which is uh, in the ML uh, space. I was amongst the first dozen employees there. And at FeatureByte, we're basically solving the AI data problem, so. Uh, thank you for he coming here. Uh, my name is Praveen. Uh, I'm a machine learning engineer at DoorDash. Uh, before that, I was at Pinterest. Uh, my expertise lies in building deep learning models for showing personalized uh, recommendations. Um, before that, I was at CMU getting my PhD in mathematics. And prior to that, I was at Columbia. That's all. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chalamaya Bachu, senior enterprise architect at Georgia Pacific, a paper manufacturing company. So my role is focused on mainly the data and analytics strategy that covers tools, technologies, frameworks, and standards. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Maxime. I'm a solution engineer in uh, Talok AI. Uh, before that, I was working in uh, Microsoft, Johnson & Johnson, in Accenture. Uh, so like I'm pretty tech engineered here. Uh, right now, um, in Taloka, I'm responsible for the um, data labeling uh, and uh, uh, good quality uh, data sets for, uh, to collect them for our clients. So I bet like this is why I'm here to talk to you about the data. Thank you so much, everyone. So uh, let's start this uh, discussion with some topic and discussion about data, uh, uh, data and what strategies are working for your organization. So let's start with Shalamaya. What do you suggest? What are some of the data strategies? So uh, a strategy is very important for any company. The first and foremost is business alignment to your data, right? Many people think data is after the fact, but today most of the enterprises are driven by data. So as a part of my role, we daily think about how do we ingest, how do we store, how do we manage, and how do we consume the data for analytics, for BI, AI, or any other applications that we do today. And it has become a core component of our enterprise uh, because we manage data as an asset and not data as something after the fact. So most of us have heard about building data products and we are in that journey right now on where we select data sets that would be used across the enterprise. We being larger enterprise with so many domains, subdomains. So we started building the data products and that is helping us a lot on how do we manage, store and ingest data in a more standard framework and a technology way. Uh, Maxim, do you want to add something? Yeah, so um, in Taloka, like we're also uh, responsible for the uh, collecting the data and to providing the data for our clients, but I will try to cover uh, another part. So how do we use uh, the data, what uh, the strategy of the data collection inside of Taloka? So as a, like, as a startup, uh, we're right now focusing on uh, like two directions. The first one, uh, either product-based, so like to uh, log information uh, about like the usage of our uh, workers, our labelers inside of Taloka uh, to control the, the like to, to to look at their behavior and to prevent some sort of fraud if they, it's possible. And the second one is to look at the uh, sales direction and like how how are we doing with the uh, in sales perspective and hopefully we can do everything in one product and uh, like this is one like, one of our strategies here. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Razi, what about you? Yeah, so uh, since we're a startup, we're, uh, uh, you know, we don't have massive volumes and scales of data. Um, but we work, uh, you know, and I personally work with tons and tons of clients. 
And one of the questions that comes up very often is, you know, just uh, where do we start with the data? What should the strategy be? And, uh, you know, there, there are two sort of truths uh, that I've learned in, uh, over the, the, the past couple of decades. One, I don't think there's any company that would say that they're happy with their data and their data strategy, right? Uh, and the second is that regardless of, of that fact, uh, there's always some data that's pretty well curated, um, that's of high quality. And my advice to pretty much uh, any company that's thinking about AI ML analytics is to start with data that's pretty well curated, uh, that's well understood, uh, and get some success first, and then sort of branch out from there. Uh, sell those successes within the, the, the company, within the enterprise, uh, to different groups uh, and to different divisions and sort of scale from that point on. Uh, trying to go at data that's, um, you know, maybe sort of on the fringes will, uh, in most cases, uh, then not end up in disappointment. So <laughs> that's my two cents on data strategy. Yeah, and I, and I agree to this point that, and I think that's what we always feel in this field, right? Like the model development actual artificial intelligence or ML model is just like 20% of the work because the 80% of the work is actually trying to make sure that we have the data in the form and in the quality that can go through that uh, ML pipelines and model deployment. So uh, Praveen, what, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, so from my experience, uh, so I, I worked at places where there is a lot of data. So the problem that I am forced to deal with is since I have so much data, usually storing data costs a lot of money. You have to store it in a data like S3, so on and so forth. Uh, we have retention policies, right? Because we do not have unlimited resources to share, to save the data. Uh, uh, in terms of having, having uh, storing the data, I, I agree with whatever Raj was saying a while ago. You know, what is the data that you're storing that is important? Uh, to give you some context, I built deep learning models for showing relevant ads uh, in the light of uh, what Apple introduced uh, in regards to the privacy changes. We'll come back to this again. So now platforms like Facebook, Snap, Pinterest, they are unable to track users on third-party websites. So it essentially means we have less features that are available to us. Uh, so if users are willing to share that data, great. Otherwise, we would have to work with whatever we have in showing personalized content to users. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think, and, and I think that's great insight from someone who has worked in this space. And I agree. And we are going to talk a little bit in deeper in the session about the privacy and security. So the next topic I want to discuss with you guys is about some of the challenges that you face in data sourcing. And then we are going to transition to what kinds of tools or technologies that you guys use or you would like to suggest to our audience. So let's start with Maxim. Uh, some thoughts on the challenges. Well, I also try to cover uh, this topic from our client perspective. Uh, so I would say uh, um, a lot of our clients coming out to us just to like to, to label the existing data or to uh, to collect the data from the open sources. It's always uh, really hard to train your ML model without data. Um, so uh, to do this, uh, uh, like uh, we we see that two trends. The first one is like big tech companies who is already have a lot of uh, log data inside, so they could reuse uh, the log of their products, and they don't really need uh, some something outside. Another approach uh, is when you're trying to develop the new product, or uh, you're just like small small business and you, you don't need to to store all of this information. Uh, you're trying to find the, the resources uh, somewhere. Uh, one of the approaches is like to use an open source uh, data sets or to use um, uh, synthetic data sets. But unfortunately, this is not uh, the best approach because like, it's pretty limited. The quality of the open data sets could be pretty low. So uh, that's why like, we are um, uh, trying to, uh, to use uh, the uh, human in the loop, ap loop approach. Uh, we have a, a very diversified crowd. It's more than one million people uh, working in one 
100, company, uh, 100 countries uh, speaking 40 different languages, so uh, we can work 24 hours uh, a day. And my, especially my work is to guarantee the great quality of the final results, so you don't need to think about it, just use it as a service. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and then from the perspective, so I work for the city government, so our perspective is a little bit different from when you compare to like an enterprise where because our effort is mostly preferred on making sure that whatever tools and uh, models that we are developing, we are making them transparent, we are uh, helping the residents of the city as well as we are making sure that the government is being accountable. So for us, uh, the data quality are, is one of the biggest challenge that we face because some of the systems we have, we have them from 90s. So I can give you a very quick example that the 911 system that the city of Austin had was made in like two, early 2000s. So all the data that was coming there was like very raw in form. So you can't do a lot of uh, like modern deployment on this unless you make significant changes to like the data quality, making sure that, and then uh, in order to do so, you also have to make sure that you are not uh, tampering with the data because again, very uh, important for city government to make sure that they are transparent. People of the city know what's going on. So that is like one, uh, some of the perspective that I have on this. And then Shalamaya, what do you want to add on this? Yeah, uh, definitely. I think most of the people here would have faced those challenges in sourcing the data, right? So for a manufacturing company like us, we have a lot of manufacturing sites which are not having high bandwidth of internet, right? So we are 150 plus in US and getting data from a manufacturing site to your cloud is one of the major challenge. Uh, leaving the other challenges in regular data ingestion. So the first and the foremost is data is not cheap. We think, yeah, we have the data, we just do anything we want, but to collect the data from an edge, an edge could be a factory or a site, to your cloud and then creating analytics on top of it is a very expensive effort. So it goes down to the foundations on some of the challenges on how do we upgrade our infrastructure at every level, be it cloud, be it on-prem, be it in middleware, right? So that was the greatest challenge we had and it took almost three to five years for us to up the network infrastructure, up the cloud, up the internet at the local manufacturing sites. And the other thing in an enterprise, again, I'm just, uh, taking the other topics is about the governance aspect, right? We have a lot of data from ERPs, a lot of data from IoT, a lot of data from other applications. So how do we govern the data? Who's responsible for the data? Who is changing the data? So all this come in, in, in the challenges of entire end-to-end -end data cycle, but data acquisition itself from site to the cloud was a major challenge. And the other challenges in a regular data ingestion is the different type of data integrations that are available in the market today. Be it API, be it JDBC, ODBC, be it a database, you have a different plethora of tools. And how we are trying to solve is using a framework-based approach and not picking an ETL tool or different type of tools for every other data integration. So we are going through a framework-based approach which supports most of your integration mechanisms and you just go via configuration and not reinvent all the existing pipelines. If I may add, uh, I agree with uh, Chalamaya in the sense that we have a lot of unstructured data. Uh, and in some sense, the promise of deep learning uh, is to you know, just feed uh, the unstructured data and the model would inherently learn the patterns that exist in the data. Uh, while in theory that sounds uh, nice, but in practice, you still need to, you know, spend quite a bit of time doing uh, feature development, right, uh, to essentially feed these features into your model. Uh, so that is, you know, yeah, that is one challenge that I foresee. And for me personally, you know, the biggest challenge that uh, we face uh, at Big Tech is, you know, you have these models, really complex, sophisticated deep learning models, which are nice in the sense that, you know, you can do offline development, so on and so forth. But when you have to serve these models at scale, meaning let's say you go to facebook.com, they have to render the page in 450 milliseconds, right? 400 to 450 milliseconds, whatever that number is. So that's a relatively, that's, that's, a, that's the latency requirements are very high, right? Uh, so the challenge there is how do you serve a model which is fairly complex uh, which does a great job at personalizing content, 
within a relatively short span of time. That's the challenge that I have to deal with. Yeah, I've, and I think if if I may add to that, uh, even for enterprise AI, uh, you know, where you may be just using classical ML instead of uh, deep learning, um, and you know, where where the data volumes may not be quite uh, the same as big tech. Uh, the feature engineering, feature deployment, so basically preparing data, deploying it in production, managing it, governing it, that's just a super, super challenge. I mean, uh, you know, I, I've been in the space for, for the past 10 years. Um, the, the modeling part of the model lifecycle in, in many ways has been solved uh, through technologies like AutoML. Um, but when it comes to doing the, the, the hard part <laughs> of ML, which is everything to do with the data, um, you know, that, that is still very much sort of a manual process. There are just too many people involved. Uh, you've got data scientists and then data engineers and the back and forth between those two just, um, you know, sort of brings the whole process to a grinding halt. Uh, that's the challenge that I, I live with uh, day in and day out. Yeah, and I think like these are some of the challenges that I think everyone in this room who have worked with data in any capacity have faced at some point of time. So uh, let's continue the conversation around like tools and technologies and the frameworks that you guys use or you guys recommend. So let's start with Praveen. Uh, what are your thoughts on these things? So let's let's separate the ML pipeline into several components and then we could talk about uh, each of these components in detail. Uh, so there is offline feature development. So you have ETL pipeline, so on and so forth. And then it also really depends on the use case that you have. So are you going to be serving this model online? Meaning when you go to facebook.com or let's say you go to google.com and then you search for something, Google needs to show relevant content to you, meaning it's an online model, right? So it's going to take in attributes real time and then it's going to come up with relevant personalized content to you in real time. So it's a real time. Uh, this is being served in real time you could have an offline model wherein you do not have the latency constraints. So you, the requirements, the kind of stack that you're gonna have is really dependent uh, on your use case. But at a high level, you have offline development, offline feature development, which involves ETL pipelines. As you know, you could use Spark, Hive, Databricks is a popular enterprise software that people are using these days. Uh, and then there is online feature serving you know, you essentially compute these features. Again, when it comes to online features, there are real-time features, there are batch features. I do not want to go into specifics. Uh, and then when it comes to offline model developments, there are frameworks. Uh, there is TensorFlow, there is PyTorch uh, that you can leverage to build uh, your models. And the thing is, how do you deploy, you know, the framework for deploying these models to production? And then finally, to be able to uh, serve these models uh, you know, for example, if people are on AWS, AWS offers SageMaker uh, as uh, a feature serving, uh, model serving uh, framework. Similarly, GCP provides a uh, uh, framework for serving models. So yeah, these are, these are the different components that, you know, involve the ML pipeline. Yeah, and I think like it is very important for uh, distinguishing between these two models because uh, like from the enterprise perspective, it is very important to understand like online versus offline and what kind of audience you have. Sometimes, for example, in my work, uh, you have to define whether some kind of model has to be viewed by, let's say, like internal city staff or directors or like the higher city executives versus there are some dashboards or some models and develop uh, tools that has to be viewed by the public. So you always have to make sure that you understand your audience in terms of like that uh, data literacy level as well and then understand and create those frameworks around it. Uh, so maybe uh, uh, Shalamaya, let's hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, being an enterprise, uh, the tools and technology is one of the emotional topic because everyone has their own, you know, idea about this tool is better versus this technology is better. And coming up with so many data teams in, in our company, it was not that easy. Uh, so the way we approached the solution was a hybrid approach on open source with a managed open source or with an enterprise software, right? Whether it's engineering, whether it's storing, whether it's the AI part, we mix and match these platforms, as I mentioned before, that is how we created a framework based on the use case, based on the value, 
based on the people available to you for working, that is where we decide this is your pattern to build your ML pipeline or ML code. Again, we are not, I'm not saying we are very maturely doing it. We are in the process of going that way. Now, uh, the other important aspect for an enterprise is scale. Right? We have 150 plus manufacturing sites, so one ML model deployed at one site has to be deployed at all the sites at the same time because we predict how we are, how an asset is evolving, some safety concerns for people. There are a lot of things that are real time and also at offline on the prediction. So scale is an important factor, which is solved by cloud to a certain extent, but still your platforms or softwares have to support deploying models at large scale. So that is what we are doing at our organization today. Okay, Maxim, uh, what, what do you think? Well, just to add here, there's so many <laughs> Clever thoughts was uh, added before. Um, my idea that like I see that um, many companies right now do not try to invent or like build something from the scratch, some products from the scratch, but to reuse the existing products on the market, and it really helps to speed up the whole processes uh, to to be concentrated on the business you have to do and your like uh, your key goal. And uh, yeah, so uh, in Tolok we also. Uh, using the same approach we're trying to use uh, the open source uh, products or the uh, li licensed enterprise products uh, for the uh, data gathering uh, data um, like comparison of the different uh, versions of the data or uh, uh, building the dashboards yeah that's what we do uh, Razi, let's hear your thoughts yeah, I think uh, the, you know, when you think about architecture, data architecture, especially, uh, some of the things to consider uh, is the space just keeps changing and evolving day in and day out, right? Uh, both the business keeps changing as well as the, the, the technology and, uh, you know, the frameworks keep evolving. Uh, and so it's super important to have an architecture that's very agile. Um, the, the way I tend to think about this is, think in terms of Lego blocks. Uh, so have a solid foundation uh, that focuses on security, privacy, governance, but then be able to layer in you know, different components as necessary and be able to sort of update uh, different components of the stack uh, as in, and, and when the data you know, business needs evolve or technologies change. Uh, so having something that's very modular uh, as an architecture is, is super, super important. Uh, if I may add, uh, I, I, I agree with uh, Razi. One important component that we forgot to address is alerts, right? So now you have data, you have machine learning models, you have, it could be an offline machine learning model, or you could have an online machine learning model that is serving real-time traffic. What kind of an alert systems, uh, what kind of alert systems do you have to ensure uh, that the system is not breaking down, right? So you have your features, uh, you've trained your model on offline data, now you're serving real-time data. The feature distribution when you're serving online could be different from whatever the model was trained on. Or for whatever reason, you know, there was data corruption and the model's performance suddenly went down. What kind of mechanisms do you have uh, to debug uh, and monitor uh, the metrics? Uh, I think this is extremely important. Again, we could classify this as, you know, having uh, you know, you could use Flink-based systems to set up real-time alerts. Uh, there are also enterprise softwares uh, that people use to set up uh, alerts. People also use feature distributions to monitor uh, changes in feature distribution. Uh, I think this this is an important thing. Standard alerts like, you know, a, a feature pipeline failed, emails being sent, so on and so forth. I think it's uh, is also fairly commonly used. Yeah. Yeah, and I think like one common uh, theme that uh, co we cover, all of us covered in different ways is uh, like the difference between using like an open source platform versus like an enterprise level. So I want to uh, put this question, let's say, which start with Shalamaya that if I am, uh, I am working for a very small startup and uh, I want to understand what should be the approach. Should I start with the open source or should I buy an enterprise? I am very small scaled maybe let's say 100 employers, like what do you suggest from your experience? Like how should I approach this problem of having, whether having an open source versus like a buy, a buy a tool and then work on it? Yeah, it always depends on the customer that you would like to serve, right? 
So when you use a enterprise software, you have some components already built in which would give you or uh, accelerate value to the customer faster versus using open source, you have to stitch those components together, create a framework or, or some architecture as uh, Razi mentioned on the Lego blocks. So it always depends on how you want to grow as a startup. Should I invest in a platform or should I build a platform? So at the end of the day, your customer doesn't have to know whether you're using open source or enterprise software. As long as you provide the value to the customer in terms of product and and the services, you should be good. The way we look at uh, from, from Georgia Pacific is acceleration, right? How fast we get to the value, should we buy or should we build? And there is always a constant analysis. Again, we don't go into analysis paralysis, but we do that at a high level on what is the best way to approach this problem and then what is a better way to provide a solution. Razi, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, agree hundred percent. I think it's uh, you know as as a startup, uh, you know, and and experience with startups before. Uh, usually, startups are are much more engineering driven, and so it's easier to just get open source technologies and stitch some stuff together and and make it work. Uh, startups are usually also very budget constrained, uh, much more so than even large enterprises, and so. You know, we have to work with uh, whatever is available and, and kind of, you know, manage and, and just be very flexible and agile. Uh, for larger enterprises, I mean, especially non-tech enterprises, I think, uh, you know, what Shalamaya was saying makes 100% sense. It's really, it really comes down to, you know, are you getting any, uh, you know, competitive advantage by building instead of buying? Uh, if if you're building something unique that uh, vendors can't uh, sort of meet the requirements for off the shelf, then okay, yeah, go ahead and build. Uh, but if not, you know, just there are tons and tons of tools and enterprise tooling available. Uh, it's better to buy and accelerate. Yeah, and that is helpful. Uh, Praveen, the question I have for you is, can you suggest or can you talk a little bit about some of the open source platforms or frameworks that you have found useful in your work or whether like some of the basic things that you want to suggest here? Uh, so for ETL pipelines and stuff, uh, Airflow is very popular uh, in the tech industry. Um, you could write Spark pipelines, PySpark, uh, Scala, whatever, Hive pipelines. Uh, Airflow is really great. A lot of company, I see a lot of companies uh, uh, using Airflow uh, for Model deployment, I see a lot of companies using Spinnaker, MLflow, MLDeploy. Uh, these are uh, some technologies that I see companies using for model deployment. Uh, yeah, these are, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Maxim. Just like wanted to, like, uh, a little bit continue discussion. So we we're all talking about the uh, like, uh, small startups and the big com tech companies. And uh, my question is, so like, uh, when we're uh, talking about the startups, it's always like a choice between like what to like, to buy or to build. Um, but uh, in some big tech companies, uh, that could be the case when the, uh, the same product, but from the different vendors used in the different team. So what your thoughts here? Like, is it okay to have this? Like, is it better to have the unified uh, architecture across the whole company, or like to? to give some freedom to uh, to your teams here? Uh, so from a tech standpoint, I think, uh, let me let me uh, say this. Uh, I think there is a trade-off between building in-house versus buying enterprise software. Building in-house requires a lot of engineers, and engineers cost a lot of money. Good engineers cost a lot of money, so it's, it's very expensive to buy it, uh, to build it in-house. And then, obviously, enterprise software, there is onboarding cost, but once you've onboarded, uh, it's easy to maintain it. Uh, so there is a trade-off, constant trade-off between you know developing in-house versus uh, adopting uh, enterprise software. Uh, now, in regards to whatever uh, uh, my fellow panelists were saying, you know, if we are adopting an enterprise software, then the architecture that we like to adopt uh, should work for use cases across the company, right? So we want to make sure, uh, like for instance, if you're using Databricks, 
we want to ensure that it works for all the teams across the company. Uh, so in that sense, the design that we want to adopt should be modular as Razi uh, was uh, referring to a while ago. Yeah, and so uh, I'd like to spend some last minutes of this panel by uh, while discussing the data security, privacy, and governance, because I think it is like a huge part of data management and the topic. So I believe like, for example, working for the public administration, it is always number one priority for all of us to have that data security and privacy intact. We have a lot of data sets where you have publicly identifiable information, the PIIs. We have to make sure that we are following all the protocols that city, even the federal government in some cases are putting forward. So whenever we are using any kind of model development or deployment, it is always important for us to understand that security and as, as Rezi said, like data governance is again important. Who is the owner of data? Who should have the access to it? What should be the level of access? Should he have access to like edit the data or just use the data? Who should have the viewing access? And the second part is how we make sure that we are doing this in a transparent manner. So I think this is something that very is that is very important for us as well. I know uh, Maxim initially talked about the synthetic data. So I want to hear your perspective on this entire security, privacy, and data governance, and then we'll add every other uh, panelist. Well, you're just to it here, so I, th I think um, um, all the like data governance have to be. Uh, specified in the policy of the company, otherwise it will be like a mess. Um, uh, speaking about the usage of the, some data that is like impossible to collect somewhere abroad, yes, um, one of the approaches is like to use the um, synthetic data, but uh, like and use like different um, generative models that are pretty popular right now. Uh, unfortunately, right now they are pretty. Uh, limited with the number of the templates that they use so it's always better like not to, in terms of like the pi information but uh, in terms of um, like less sensitive data it's better to use uh, the hybrid approach of the synthetic data the data from from your logs or from your company from your products and the data collected uh, especially spe for, for for this uh, product yeah, thank you. And then, yeah, Shalama, do you wanna? So, uh, security again is a key component of any enterprise. Uh, one way we got to that place, again, we are still in the journey, every, again, everyone is in the same place, is uh, leveraging a concept called data virtualization, where I just mentioned about framework. So data virtualization is our core component on how do we consume the data, because that is where you have to govern audit on who is using the data and why are they using the data. It could be dashboard, it could be an AI model, or it could be you know, some other customization on top of that. So we use data virtualization as a key layer for every consumption of any data from any data store, be it a lake, be it a warehouse. We haven't gone to transactional systems yet, but we would like to go there on how, who is sourcing the data, who is building warehouses, who is consuming the data. So data virtualization has been the central part of our entire framework because it's centrally managed, it is secured, it is authorized, it's governed. So you don't have a way out unless you hack into the system and get a backdoor entry. But that is how we are leveraging or trying to uh, improve the security and the governance aspects of data at an enterprise. Uh, Razi, do you wanna add to this point? Uh, yeah, I think the... Uh, so one of the areas that uh, you know folks don't think about is when, especially when it comes to ML, uh, you've created features. Um, uh, you know these are data inputs into ML models. You need to govern and manage those as well. You need to still have uh, privacy around uh, and security around all of the features. Um, you know, lineage to, to make sure that uh, you're again figuring out who's using what, what features uh, in which types of models. So just as you were thinking about, uh, you know, extending your architectures to doing ML and ML pipelining as well, just uh, think about how you extend um, some of the, the security governance, et cetera, uh, into, you know, feature pipelines as well. Uh, one other comment I would just make is, 
you know, keep everything modular, innovate a lot. Uh, but when it comes to security, privacy, governance, try to keep things as sort of straight-jacketed as possible because, uh, you know, the fewer exceptions, the, the better the, the, the overall management is. Yeah, and, and I can totally relate to this point because, like, for example, the city of Austin has 20, 25 different uh, departments, including, like, the public utility, water utility, so we have a lot of like smaller enterprises within the one city. So it is very important to have like a constant uh, security protocols, the privacy and everything intact and making sure that it is uniform across. So as you uh, grow your organization or your enterprise, it is very important to have that uh, guidelines, security protocols, privacy, uh, all of it intact. So uh, I'll let Praveen uh, uh, wrap it up with like some uh, conclusion around it. Uh, you know, to give a concrete example on what Razi was saying around uh, privacy pertaining to features, right? This has uh, impacted uh, companies such as Pinterest, Facebook, all social media companies that generate uh, most of their revenues through advertising. Uh, this is in light of the uh, changes that Apple brought in uh, in the iOS 14 rollout. So you probably got a notification on your iPhone saying, hey, do you want this app to track your uh, off-site behavior uh, or something along those lines. So, you know, uh, as a machine learning engineer, what I essentially try to, you know, want, tr tr want to predict is based on your behavior, based on what you're doing on the web, I want to predict how likely you're going to make a purchase, right? Let's say you see a Walmart ad. What likely, uh, how likely is this person going to make a purchase on Walmart? So what I would essentially be tracking there is the number of times that you visited Walmart from, let's say, Facebook's uh, portal. So now, if you've opted out uh, from not being tracked, I won't have access to this information. So in some sense, I'm constrained uh, in the kind of ads that I can show. I'm going to I'm going to do a poor job at personalizing content to you. And the model's predictions would also go down because now if you've opted out, this feature is essentially a null when you're making a prediction. So consequently, you would make less predictions. And the impact that this would have on advertisers is, now since I'm making less predictions, if you look at how auction dynamics works, uh, the bids go up. So advertisers have to pay more. Advertisers are paying more, which essentially, but the conversions are going down. Right, because now I'm not doing a good job at making these predictions of conversion rates. Uh, so eventually, long story short, this leads to lower ROAS. If you know what ROAS is, it's revenue over ad spent for advertisers. So uh, they're getting a low ROI. Consequently, uh, advertisers start scaling down their spend, which essentially means social media companies are going to make less money out of it. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think like what I'm hearing is like a trade-off between sharing your data versus like the kind of features that you can get. So like, for example, if you share everything with like these companies, these companies are going to give you better products, but they are also taking your data. So basically when you are not buying the product, you are the product. I think this is like the common theme that we are hearing with this. So yeah, I think like this was uh, pretty interesting. I'll let Shalamaya add if you want to add something on this. No, nothing uh, much, just as Razi and other panelists said, just make it more modular, make it more flexible, and always provide a room to grow on how you structure, organize, manage, and consume the data. Yeah, thank you. Maxim, any final thoughts? No, it was like very good said. <laughs> okay, uh, Razi? Time for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, thank you everyone for attending, and I hope uh, you got to hear something new that is useful for you. So thank you, everyone.